Boom. All right, Liz, thank you so much for joining on the Hot Drinks Podcast. How are you doing today? Hi, Sean. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, I'm excited to catch up and, and hear some good stories from you. Well, we'd like to start off with our favorite hot drink. What is your favorite hot drink? Not you know necessarily today, but uh, on course, some of those trying times. What's your go-to? Uh, it's a great question. And I actually, although our listeners can't see them, I have a few different hot drink vessels, yeah. as well, they're appropriately clips. called in the field. Um, so I will tell you that that it is situationally dependent. Oh. So if I'm going sailing, your sailboat carries your gear. So you can bring a coffee French press. You wake up later in the morning, you can sit around and enjoy a coffee on the beach. So if I'm sailing, I'm a coffee drinker. Um, if I'm hiking, of course, I'm not going to bring all that weight along. And so I will drink out of my preferred vessel of choice, a baby Nalgene. Nice. And I definitely am not going to put the standard issue Alaska powdered milk into this baby Nalgene, because if I do, it'll never come out. So <laughs> I tend to like to drink a a green tea with a bit of brown uh -huh. sugar that I would have substituted out for the white sugar in the ration. Okay. And my hot drink of choice today is, is a turmeric ginger tea with a little bit of milk and black pepper. Wow. And, and what is that vessel? That would break in the field. Um, but it's a beautiful teacup that my brother brought back for me from Japan. So that's nice. what we've got going today for our wow. hot drink. Fantastic. I think I need to expand that question, not just ask what the favorite drink is, but what the favorite vessel to the have vessel. a drink is. You've just shown me, uh, you know, three <laughs> vessels in a minute there. And uh, I'm sure you have a lot more that you uh, are, are coveted. But uh, yeah, sometimes the vessel is just as important as the drink, I think. Exactly. It's the process. It's not uh, not about the finish line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we all have our favorite ones that, that'll last the years. And uh, because if they don't, they're not around very long. On, on they're a not field, around on a very long. And we need everything to have multiple uses. Exactly. I'll add one more quick addition to that, that a sure. favorite co-instructor and colleague and dear friend, uh, her hot drink vessel system was once called a chemistry set by no another co-instructor. <laughs> awesome. So maybe if she pops up on your podcast, I'll let her tell that story herself. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sh share the dates. Who was it? Uh, Janie Ringham. <laughs> oh, yes. Janie. Yeah. I want to get her on for sure. She'll be great. I've seen her use it underway chemistry. aboard big... <sighs> keel sailboats uh, where you actually get to cook with a real propane stove. Right. And I've also seen her pack them into kayaks and aboard no sailboats way. as well. All right. Well, we'll have to get her on to hear the real story of the chemistry uh, set. <laughs> that, that's Great. awesome. All right. Well, let, let's jump into your first story. Uh, to hear you got one about sea lions. Now, is it sea lions in Alaska or sea lions in Baja or, or some other location? Well, that's a great question and a great clarification because I live in Baja, California, lower that's California, right. that, that kind of arm or elbow of land that's breaking off from the Mexican mainland. And there are California sea lions down here. And these sea lions mm -hmm. are friendly, actually, uh, in one of the local islands, you can go and the juveniles will come and the babies will even nibble on a snorkel. So let's actually drop into the context of the sea lion nugget story, which happened right. in Prince William Sound, Alaska. Mm. So northern latitudes, much colder waters, glacial fed waters. And so the sea lions that you'll find in the rookeries up there where they congregate are the stellar sea lions. Right. So here we were one day on an outdoor educator course. This was in probably August of 2009 and was paddling along with three wonderful co-instructors, a really fun, motivated student group. Um, most of them were thrilled by marine mammals. We did have one very valiant and brave student who had told us at the beginning of that section that this person really was facing a personal fear by mm. coming out on the water and was not terrifically excited to have encounters with marine oh, no. mammal life, um, but they loved birds. So here we were sitting one morning. Um, it was a particularly rainy summer. And so on the water that will often produce foggy conditions in the morning. 
So we do a lot of coastal sea kayaking and paddling in this course area. And we also do little hops from one island to another. So on this morning, we were on Busby Island, which mm. for listeners who are not familiar with the sound, it's actually right near Bly Island and the infamous Bly Reef, which was where the Exxon Valdez tanker right. ran aground and, you know, created a, a devastating oil spill in that area. Okay. So our, our, our radar was up about managing our risk on the water, and we had to be very attentive because we were about to cross a shipping channel. So we got all prepared. We were launching our boats in the morning, and we did something that kayakers do. We definitely were going to stick together and travel as a pod, like a pod of whales. And we were also using our available tools for risk management. One of those is a magnetic compass. So if you want to cross from one point to another, and all of a sudden you are what we call socked in by fog, uh, you have this nifty magnetic instrument. So you can paddle a straight line the same way you would sort of walk and hold a compass if you've got a compass on the bow of your boats. So we set up for our compass and we also took our very high frequency marine band radios and you do something that's also a preventative measure. You, you have to use, you're Canadian, you can appreciate this, use bad French. You say, mm. securite, securite, <laughs> securite. Mm. And you essentially let any, any boat traffic, marine traffic in the area know that there's going to be a whole bunch of you and that you only sit, what, about a, a meter right. at most <laughs> off the water. <laughs> so two to, three up in, two to three feet up in the air adults depending on your height so you're not very visible and these boats don't have any lights on them so off we set into the fog paddling along our bearing we made a successful uneventful crossing and then we believed that we had turned south we were going to head down and check out the sea lion rookery and we're paddling along paddling along and as i mentioned the cold waters you see big hunks of ice they're actually broken yeah. off bits of iceberg the bergy bits and then all of a sudden the fog lifts and we're supposed to see only water to our left, as we believe we are traveling along the outer coast. And uh, we saw land to our left oh, and no. recognized that however, we had, although we had paddled along our straight bearing, there are also these water currents mm. that create set and drift. So although we paddled the straight course, we basically got set further to the north and end up in a little internal bay. No so <laughs> it was quite a good one. So we enjoyed the show and we paddled a little further than we thought we were going to. Um, but we wanted to really keep our wits about us because later the fog came back down and the school's protocol at the time was when you're coming up to this stellar sea lion rookery, you really want to give it a wide berth. Mm -hmm. So think about these animals. They're in their home. You don't want anybody barging into your house and, and uh, kind of getting all up in your face. And so these sea lions also would not appreciate that either. So the person who is the designated course leader is, is a wonderful friend and colleague. I understand he's also been a guest, his guest with you here on the Hot Drinks podcast. His name is Oscar. All right. And Oscar now speaks impeccable English. He's Mexican born. Um, at the time, his English was a bit more accented. And, and part of the, the charm of, of the natural history nugget about the sea lion Lions that he told that day was that he told it in, in his voice at the time, the sea lion rookery will be very populated. So he tells us all about who's going to be there, the dominant males that have the big bumps on their heads, surrounded essentially by what the humans would call a harem of female sea lions. So we're talking about hundreds of individuals. He's describing this to us. And as we're approaching the point, we still can't see them yet. So we're, we're keeping our boats doing something just called holding position and trying to, trying to not move too far or too fast, when all of a sudden it becomes clear that and we're like, there's some weird noise happening. It's kind of a low din. As Oscar's talking and we're sort of moving along around the coast, 
we peek around the point and we get the first view of this massive mm-hmm. colony of hundreds of animals. Mm-hmm. And Oscar is still continuing to explain. He hasn't been talking for more than a couple of minutes, but the next thing he tells us, he has turned his kayak around to face us. So that you know, we're in probably 10 to 12 boats, um, single and double kayaks. And we're looking at Oscar intently, and he describes the uh, scouting team. The sea lions will send out Mm. a number of young juvenile males because we're going to be close in their territory. They want to see what's going on. They're going to come and check us out. And on cue, above Oscar, sitting on the water, no way. An animal oh. rose easily five to six to seven heads above where he was sitting. His eyes wisened, wisened to look essentially like dinner plates. And not one, but two, three, four, nine animals literally came up. These are pinnipeds. So they've got forward flippers and then these kind of tail fins. So they're tail walking. They're standing up in the water and they're making really quite a loud scandal, indicating that they are scouting us out. And Oscar, without any further direction, immediately at the top of his voice shouts, the sea lion nugget is over. <laughs> no way. And paddle we did. Now you'll remember the one student facing fears. Right. Oh, this person really had a tough go of it that day. But among that student group, I have never seen a better forward stroke, <laughs> more efficient rotation, perhaps a death grip on the paddle that people sometimes remember to sort of ease their hands and lighten up on. And paddle we did. And no. off we went. We took as wide a berth as the fog would let us that day. And we got out of there as quickly as we could. They didn't follow you? And they followed us. <gasps> no way. <laughs> the scouting team was really on duty. And they were they were going to get paid that day and, and make sure they did what they needed to do, which was not let a lot of kayakers in close. And so... They followed us by the time we got to camp, which was a couple more hours later. um, There were only two scouts and those scouts stayed overnight and they stayed with us. No way. We were out there in the morning trolling back and forth. They were not interested in our fishing. No one was going to take a quick dip to bathe in the cold water that day. And we continued on through the course and the one scout stayed with us for three days. No way. I've Every never heard of that. Every single campsite. And of course, you can imagine the popular refrain that the sea lion disregarded and it's entirely, the sea lion nugget is over. <laughs> <laughs> the sea lion didn't care. So wow. that was the story of the stellar That's amazing. sea lion. Did it uh, come close at all when, it, when you guys were paddling or is it just kind of oh, paddling along with it? Oh, they definitely came close. And yeah. the fun thing about this scout is... Just when you thought you'd lost him, right. he would <laughs> kind of pop up next to a boat and surface. And whether you were scared of sea mammals or not at the time, everyone right. definitely jumped and you got a chance to practice that bracing stroke yeah. and make sure your boat didn't flip off to the side. Um, oh, but man. it definitely kept us on our toes for the rest of the course. Yeah, I, I believe I've been by that uh, rookery and uh, it's incredible the amount of, of sea lions there in, in one spot. And it's it's amazing. Like you don't see them all over Prince William Sound, but there's a couple small, you know, gems where they like to hang out and, and they certainly didn't follow us when we left there. So that, that's pretty neat trick to, to have a, have <laughs> so a friend. So you would probably alongside. follow the protocols a bit more closely and, and gave them a bit well, more. We, we, made it didn't have, we didn't have the fog. We didn't have the fog. We could see it coming a mile away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We had it on our charts, but of course, when you get there, it's different. Um, yeah. And one other thing, actually, that the that the scouts did, which I didn't mention in my excitement remembering, was I know that you have have kids, Sean. So perhaps they have taken dominoes at some point mm. and set them up all over the living room, where you tip one domino and then. Brrr, this massive cascade effect happens. So once the scouts had set the alarm, there was a massive cascade effect of hundreds of animals. No, coming at you. Which didn't necessarily follow us, but all went into the water. Um, (laughs) I don't think anyone turned around to see if they were coming or not. Right, well, that's their safe place, right? Paddle, paddle, paddle. 
Exactly. For, for um, certain predators, it's their safe place anyway. <laughs> Other predators, <laughs> they need to be out of the water. They need to be out of the water. Right. Wow. So that, good rule awesome. of thumb with all animals is recognizing that in the back country, you're, you're in their house. They're not that's in right. yours. Keep so your distance. Keep your distance being respectful. Yeah, I've do heard do of like thing. the odd dog following a course here and there, but I've never heard of a sea lion following a course. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Wow, we didn't, that's... we didn't give him a name or anything. No. <laughs> didn't feed them no definitely didn't do that <laughs> kept the oh. fishing to adult to a dull sea lion roar yeah right all right that's awesome i really appreciate that one so sure. this next one uh, has a vhf involved is this uh on the ocean in uh, prince william sound and kayaks as well or uh so it's it's on the ocean it's very high frequency and i gave you a little title for the story which was what is FFU on the VHF? So the very high frequency radio, um, this time was being used in the waters of Baja, California. Okay. So the inside of the Baja Peninsula, the Sea of Cortez, and on this particular expedition, we were sailing these, these shippy little boats called the Drascom Longboat. Um, so it's a little open fiberglass sailboat. It's about 21 feet long. It's got three sails. And in the name of still camping, um, what the school does with these boats is you can anchor them quite close up to the shore. You put down a bow anchor in the water and then the, the pointy end of the boat, and then you back the stern or the back end to the boat up to the coast and you actually put an anchor in the sand and that lets students and instructors unload their gear. And mm -hmm. so we were traveling with a student group who was just culminating a whole semester out in the back country. So imagine these semesters can be anywhere from about 78 to 90 days. So they're coming up on 80 something days in the wilderness. These folks had, had gone hiking already, sea kayaking, and now they were sailors. Um, and they were a fun group. They were very competent. Uh, they took the leadership curriculum seriously, which was one of our principal objectives out there. And they really loved the place we were. So they really got into the marine life, the desert life. Um, there's actually a desert that butts right up to the sea. So they would write That's stories right. about the scorpions or the funny puffer fish. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're really absurd animals whose defense mm. is to essentially blow up into a balloon that renders them defenseless on the surface of the water. Um, so these students loved everything that they that they could about the places. We spent a, a wonderful Thanksgiving with this group in a small fishing village along the coast. And just to the south, we were finishing up some radio transmissions on an afternoon. And we wanted to put our radio classes into a bit more practice. So there's always a point in, in a leadership course where the instructors step back from the leadership and they hand it over to, to students. And, and you always do this sometimes with fingers crossed a bit. We felt confident with sure. this group. Um, so it was an afternoon where our backcountry experience shifted a bit with a bit of front country. So we did a quick sail where we were already anchored to another part of the bay where there was a little town, Agua Verde. So the mm. green water a beautiful spot, big cliffs along the shoreline, a pinnacle rock. And we had just a couple hours to sunset and moonrise. And we went into the town, mind you, we're at the end of our course. And so we went into to one of the, the little stores. The instructors stocked up on fresh vegetables, tortillas, eggs. The students stocked up on packaged baked cakes and chocolate <laughs> and chili candy and brown bubbly sugar soda pop water um and the ensuing vhf radio conversations essentially reflected as much oh, so no. i was coming back through light air and we're we're doing these little kind of zigzag short tack movements to get back to the beach when there's a really interesting conversation on board where they decide that uh, this radio protocol is okay. Now, these are international hailing channels or mm. they're public channels. So right. we've let them know to be professional. We've used a phonetic alphabet. The FFU could have been Foxtrot, Foxtrot uniform, but in this case, it wasn't. So here was the theory of one student who said, 
I think that it would be much more efficient if each vessel on the water on the entire planet had, and now you can see the sugar kicking in, <laughs> its own independent number for its boat. Say, for example, and he pulls the number out of the air and I had to write it down to remember, 478,526,208. But if I wanted to hail your boat number that was that, I would need to repeat it three times. For some reason that day, maybe it was a sugar, kicks in and he said, and of course, you'd want to end your transmission, pretend British accent, with fart, fart underpants. <laughs> Instructor, you know, the big palm plant to the forehead. Oh, no. oh my. At first, this is just, just not something that you want to And so this is two boats engage. talking to each other? Or is he this just is, chatting this about this what, on shore? He's talking about this. Now we're underway in the boat. Okay. But there are three other small boats. And he's got the one handheld radio that he will use to communicate to the right. other boats. So La Tigresa, La Tigresa, La Tigresa. This is Joa. Joa, go ahead. We'll sail back over to the... So something right. concise, short. So this was just a conversation underway that they're, they're trying to refine that protocol because they found it a bit boring with all the sugar. So one of his boatmates said, well, all right, you could do that. But you would begin with thought, thought, underpants. But of course, you would need to end with underpants, thought, thought. Now, <laughs> these are college age students. One of these students had been reading Moby Dick and telling it to the course. So plenty of level of education. But again, with the sugar, a bit of, <laughs> right. a, bit of um, a bit of wackiness going on. So the sails are flogging. This conversation is continuing. And all of a sudden, I decide that that these are these are no longer fit sailors. They're under the influence of too much sugar. So I get them off the helm and try to focus them on trimming the jib or easing the mainsail or turning around to see the mizzen sail or looking where we're heading or trying to use all of these different tricks. So at this point, they realize that they've gotten me. So now they're <laughs> doing the trick with the very high frequency radio, placing the thumb strategically close but not over the talk button and proceeding in their british accents underpants fought fought other boats and i'll look at them and my eyes get wide and they say just kidding i wasn't pressing the talk button so <laughs> this continues this continues so at some point i fire these students from the helm i say you are no longer <laughs> you are no longer going to drive this boat and the other boats, we were about to get back into where we were supposed to be. There were also now a new obstacle of much larger sailboats mm. who found protective refuge in this cove. There's a beautiful sunset happening. There's a moonrise coming up. And it's cocktail hour for these folks. So all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, wow. everyone out is out now watching what we're doing. And as the wind dies, hearing what we're doing right. as well. And they're not so, even listening on the radio. They're just hearing. They're not even listening on the radio. Uh, just sound carries over water. Yeah. So the other boats get underway. They lower their sails. They start rowing or using an outboard engine. But my crew said, we can do it. We can sail. And so it, as is the case often, uh, with students, sometimes you recognize that if you if you are not in charge, you might as well join them. And so I said, all right, sailors, ready about, everyone down to the leeward side, fart, fart, underpants, ready to tack, and tack in. I pressed my <laughs> tiller down to the leeward side, and to my delight, the sailors switch sides as designated. All of a sudden, we have the attention of all of the different cruisers sipping cocktails, and we performed a really beautiful choreographed entry back onto our beach, nice. entirely using British accents. <laughs> and every single non-transmission on the radio started with fought, fought, underpants, <laughs> and ended with underpants, fought, fought. <laughs> and these boys did everything then that they were supposed to. They loved the British accent. It got more and more quiet as the moon <laughs> rose and the sun went down. Prepare to lower the bow anchor. Ready on the bow anchor and lower. Anchor and chain on the bottom. Prepare the oars. Prepare the stern anchor. They took the boat all the way into the beach. They loved it so much that they talked quietly all the way throughout dinner. They prepared their dinner in British accents. And one of my favorite student evaluations that I've ever received ended with three initials at the bottom of it. I don't know what my program supervisor thought when she read 
FFU. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. They wow. rewarded us at the end with appropriate radio speak. Once they got <laughs> me going, I joined them and the whole thing turned out to be a beautiful afternoon and evening on the water. Wow. Well, that, that's, you know, that's an amazing example of leadership and just, you know, <clears throat> it's so much of it's meeting them halfway, you know, and I think too many times we can get set in our ways and get so focused on, uh, you know, perceived risk and, and not like if we get the, the perceived risk, it's even built up even more in our heads. And, and we're like, you know, no, we've got to do it this way. But then sometimes you just got to like bend and realize that these people have been out here for 70, 80 days and we just need to have some fun with it because, you know, Absolutely. really the risk is really low here right now. And let's just play with it instead of, you know, staying on cue with the initial curriculum. <laughs> I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the more positive course culture that you can create, and like you said, the situation awareness of figuring out when you really need to stick by all of the rules and mm -hmm. when you can maybe adapt and have a bit more fun and laugh. And it's certainly something that I, I laugh about today and find myself for no good reason switching into a pretend British accent every now and again. <laughs> that's great. You got, you got to mix it up. You got to mix it up. We talk about, we'll talk, talk about costumes at the end of the course, but I think so much of, of extended wilderness travel is just mixing things up and catching people off guard with silly stuff because, uh, you know, a lot of it is routine and routine is good, but sometimes the routine can get pretty mundane and, and the mundane on a wilderness expedition can be pretty downright hard and uh, hard physically and mentally. And so I think mixing up with these silly moments is, is critical. At least work on that. I love that. That's yeah. uh... That's great. And you definitely brought to mind some more stories when you when you mentioned uh, costumes. And All right. Do you want what to jump in with have... one now? All right. Let's jump in with one now. Um, what you have hidden at the bottom of your backpack. Mm -hmm. So a story that I was going to make a little longer, although all of my stories do tend to be long. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a quick parenthesis great. that when I was a child uh, at the dinner table, I often received a leadership directive from one of my parents, Elizabeth it's time to stop talking and eat. <laughs> so I love telling stories. I, I, uh, I remember lots of the details and always enjoy them. Yeah. So let's migrate with the whales or the sailboats um, back up to Alaska. And then we're going to head up into the Southern Talkeetna Mountains. Nice. Um, and so this was actually my first 30 day wilderness course. Um, and this one had some fun in costumes in it, and it actually had a, a pretty serious note to it as well. Um, when I think about this story, I, I remember coming down to the river. Um, there's right. that that kind of traditional gospel that I went right. down I'll in just, the river. <laughs> I'll just jump ahead. in. When you say 30-day wilderness course, you mean wilderness backpacking course, not your first Great. time in the wilderness for 30 days. Not my first time in the wilderness. No, not at all. <laughs> so that's what um, we call our right. backpacking courses in Alaska or, or generally anywhere, the backpacking courses for Knowles. All right. So you're coming right. down to the river. You got Thank that song you. in your so head. So we're coming down to the river and we've got that song in our head when I think of this story. Um, so the course, the course started off uh, with quite a bit of fun. Um, so starting back as we were just packing up, one of the things that we've made sure to add to the instructor's backpacks were as many leopard printed items of fun clothing from the costume bin as we could find. So those went in um, and, carry, and, and, and carry the weight <laughs> and carry the weight. You'll do it. Um, it pays off in the end. We ended up with multiple birthdays during yeah. that 30 day long hike. Um, and each birthday celebrant proudly donned leopard prints, one of which was a bathing costume, which looked <laughs> extraordinary over top of the clothes on all body types, I can assure you. Right. Um, so you got a lot of mileage out of that one. Um, another thing that you always check before you go into the wilderness, um, you mentioned before risk management. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we never talk about safety, um, particularly at this school, because it's something that you cannot guarantee your students. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once we're out there with both objective hazards, yeah. flowing rivers, lightning storms, and subjective hazards, the maybe we should just try to make it to the top, right. even though um, that's kind of the human factor. Um, you want to double down on as much sort of preventative risk management tools, um, whether they be physical or, you know, kind of these, these 
these learned decision-making things we're, we're using as well. So we definitely check not our VHF radio, but our ground to air radio. Um, we did a test with it. We tested batteries and we also tested our satellite telephone. Um, something else that courses tend to do is the saying of not putting all your bags in one bag, all your eggs, pardon me, in one basket. I've got some eggs here. Don't put them all in the same basket. <laughs> Definitely don't put all of your <laughs> communication devices in one backpack either. So this is going to be an important detail later on. Yeah. Um, so this was a course that didn't feel much like Alaska at the beginning. Perhaps it was an early hint of our changing climate. I had been in Alaska the summer prior and had probably, ex you know, and had experienced rain in 14 day bouts, then with a window of sun and then another right. 21 most of days. Your time. <laughs> really most of the time. So this time it had been sunny ever since we started. We were about halfway into our course, which is two weeks, almost 14 wow. days. experienced some rain and some students who weren't that interested in putting on rain jackets because they figured right. oh, well it's you gonna just, you just froze up for a second i'm gonna oh. get you to i'm gonna okay. let me double check my internet here to make sure i'm on the fast one um actually where's that uh I'll, I'll get you to repeat no sorry i'm on the slow one it might cut off and then come back as it clicks over to the faster just give me one second to you cut off when you were saying you were talking about the rain, but you hadn't got into the rain yet. Okay, you got me? There, there we are. Okay, well, I can we're back. I hear you, but the image is frozen. Okay, we're am back? I still frozen? No, nope, you're back. I think all we're right. both back. It should, it should be all good now. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so sorry. we were, we were easily able that summer to talk students into wearing costumes, but it had been so sunny, which was unseasonable right. in my experience that they weren't that interested in wearing rain gear. Um, before we got down to the river, I'll do a, a quick rewind because I mentioned that ground to air radio. Um, we started off the course and received a first re-ration in Alaska the new supply of food is brought in uh, by plane, which is mm -hmm. always quite fun. They land on giant fat tundra tires. And in this case, I went to communicate with the pilot with the ground to air radio and it immediately cut out. And so I checked it, the power wouldn't turn back on, put in the new batteries. Those also did not come on. Oh, no. So. All of a sudden, we didn't have communication with this pilot. Luckily, it was it was a day with not much wind. Um, and he was able to land, get us our re-ration. And then, unfortunately, early in that course, there was one student who ended up with an injury and needed to be what we call evacuated. So essentially, we made all of the arrangements with the first landing of the plane. The plane returned the next day, and the student went to get some some medical attention and the pilot handed me a pocket full of new batteries nice he also handed me some flagging tape so it's basically just a bright oh. colored pink or orange plastic tape um, for pilots as for sailors it's pretty important to know which way the wind blows um, so you can use it to break and mm -hmm. and successfully land all right so let's flash back forward to the first rains and we're walking down, descending a large boulder field to come to a river. Um, so we had already been uh, taken off of our course a bit by a river that was much larger than we had expected. Now I'm calling these rivers, but when you, when you check your Alaska topographical maps, they're creeks. Right. So this was, this was Boulder Creek um, that we probably hiked about five and a half miles out of our way on our planned route to go. And so if you cross a creek at what is called the toe of a glacier, basically where the glacier starts to melt and the water winds its way through the mountains, so we had done a successful river crossing there. And as we are coming down to Burt's Creek, close to the toe of the glacier, we are looking for a good place to, to cross. And evening was 
was about to fall, but in Alaska in the summer, sometimes mm. that can be at 10 or 11 o'clock at yeah. night. We'd made a long day of it. Um, and one instructor and a small student team decided to do a scout of a part of the river that you talk about being braided. So instead of being one full flowing channel, um, the river meanders and gravel bars emerge. Mm -hmm. And so you have lots of small threads or braids of this creek. And so what they did was scout most of the way across. And <laughs> most, there's of the way. most of the way across, that's operative. Right. Um, and this is something that in much reflection afterwards, we certainly owned that we needed to have scouted all of the way across. Right. Um, we did decide to wait until the next morning. Um, it gets cooler overnight. So mm -hmm. usually the snow melt is less, the water flow is less. Um, so we got up quite early. We divided ourselves into three small groups and we we're going to do a technique where you face upstream, you hold on to one another's backpack sort of in a train, and then you do a step and step coordinated choreography crossing the stream. The person on the front of the train always has something to stabilize them, whether it's mm -hmm. a hiking stick or a pole. And so we then proceeded to make this crossing in three different teams. The first team went across, made it most of the way fine, and got to what we, what we weren't sure, but was quite a deep hole. Um, and... The, stu the tallest student, you want to put taller people in the front and back. I am not a taller person. I'm a five foot two person. So I usually end up in the middle of those trains. This taller student had gotten a bit in front of the train and took a fall. And this is a fall into very cold water. I mentioned that they're fed by a glacier. And we also take other preventative measures such as not wearing additional baggy clothing that could fill up with water, um, unbuckling backpack right. waist straps. So should you need to shimmy out of your backpack, you can do so. So the one team makes it across. The second team also could have done a bit better job with some communication and some mm. indications which unfortunately that morning also didn't happen. They start off in the second team, the train moving across, and now it's, it's a taller instructor in the front. I'm in the team in the, in the sort of the last and third group. And then it became really a quite scary moment. Um, certainly one of the, one of I would say the most scary moments I, I remember in my consciousness in the back country. Wow. Um, so the instructor found where the first student had fallen over and it hadn't necessarily been about keeping the train together, but there was quite a deep hole. Hmm. So they were so, crossing at the same place, crossing the same place, even though we had seen what had happened. So the stick goes in the water. He feels the deep, deep hole announces there's a deep hole just as he does, he falls down. And then it's a team of students standing behind him. The next student who was shorter fell down, went down face first. And now we have one instructor and one student who are being set by the current. We're hoping that they will get set over to the other side. How deep um, are we talking here? Are we talking like waist deep or knee deep? Obviously, it depends on the height, but it, that's that was very key. So one of the taller instructors and students had scouted saying it's just over knee deep. Uh -huh. So some of the shorter folks in the expedition for them, it was definitely approximating waist deep water okay. wow. um, and quite cold water. And so there then ensued. Um, some some scary moments of figuring out what to do. My team went later than we should have. We should have set ourselves up preventatively down there, um, but to do what you call just kind of a human chain to see if we can link elbows, stand on the shore, get somebody out into the middle and maybe hand out a hiking pole, but we weren't able to get to the part of the river that we were at. And so the instructor is able to get out of his backpack. So right now you've got two people in the water and there's got two, two or three more that are standing in a line still? That are standing on line. And as this is happening, one, two, three, they all fall in. Mm -hmm. 
Um, The team that had crossed previously was able to quickly pull out two of the students. And the last one had had the benefit of watching what was happening. And he announced, get out of your backpacks, which is protocol. You Right. In, in some it. of the course areas, certainly in Alaska. So he immediately was able to jettison his pack and you want to turn into what they call a defensive swimmer position where you're looking downstream with your feet up. Um, and so he was able to get out of his pack. Now, mind you, both of these packs shoot by us and no one is able to retrieve them. And as you can imagine, as I know, you know, backpack, and there's a lot of important things in those backpacks, mm-hmm. including the satellite telephone. So we watch this shoot by us. So we're just in the midst of managing this situation. Luckily, I, I, I can't imagine that it went on for more than a minute, but it was certainly one of those slow motion minutes of life where you see many things flash before your eyes. And thankfully, everyone was quickly able to eddy out um, the student who had gone down face first was able to turn, get a face up to the oxygen in the air and float with the pack and ended up crossing back to the other side where we had started, grabbed onto a boulder, was met by other students. And so everyone was okay. Oh. Um, we definitely So is everybody had... on the other side of the river now, except for your group? So we're, we're essentially divided in half. Okay. Um, so we were 13 students, three instructors, 16 of us. And I think we were eight and eight, the okay. way that we ended up. Um, how, many, how many packs are missing? So we're missing two backpacks. Okay. The oh. one student who had said, get rid of it and an instructor backpack. Mm-hmm. And that's when the sky opened up. And everyone got to really see what Alaska rain was like. So (laughs) just to keep things lively. um, We also did another thing that that we should have done differently, which was creating teams where everyone would have what they needed in the right backpacks. So Mm. we mix up hiking groups and we have different elements of someone carries a cooking stove and someone carries a cooking pot. Um, but if you have a stove, but no pots to boil water, it doesn't make a whole puzzle. Mm. Um, so here we were with disorganized gear and folks who were quickly approaching, you know, perhaps mild hypothermia, um, unclear at the time, but definitely needing aggressive rewarming, which includes basically stripping off all of your cold and Mm. wet clothes and everyone collaborated and coordinated and there was some some incredible quick decision making and and peer leadership and self-leadership and designated Mm. leadership you find a pot you go ahead and get the stove boiling you set out a tent fly you pull out a sleeping bag we got the instructor and the students warmed up which took a while that process probably took maybe two and a half hours Okay, but you're still divided on each side of the trail. We're still right. divided, but and so your group is still in the middle of the river in the braids. No, no, on no. The gravel so, bar. So we've been able to. So as the action is happening of the floating, um, we all make it back to the sides of the river. The initial mm-hmm. braids that we crossed were ankle deep, okay. and were something that everyone could just walk across individually. Right. Um, so we have a wow. colorful explosion of gear everywhere. And, and did you guys go down looking for the backpacks at this point or did you just so focus once, on the, getting out of the clothes? Great question. Um, so the folks who, who managed the full crossing, um, they didn't have anyone who had spent so much time in the water. So they weren't really as concerned. They had one student who was able to warm up quickly in a sleeping bag and everyone else was able to get into rain gear. And so they did run the scouting parties further down the river and they spotted one of the packs, one of the packs they couldn't even see, and it had lodged on another gravel bar. So we thought, okay, maybe we'll we'll be able to get down and get it. Um, On my end of the river were the two folks who'd spent longer time in the cold Mm -hmm. water. And so it was really just managing the scene, 
getting them warm back up. Um, one real key there for everyone who's ever out in the wilderness and encounters these unexpected cold temperatures, unplanned incidents, um, boiling water um, and getting it really hot and then putting it inside a water bottle that you then pad with some kind of jacket or warm layer to put inside the sleeping bag turned out to be the real key. Mm. Um, as well as some things that you could eat easily from a prone position on right. or on your side, like peanut butter. Um, so those were great things to get these folks. You got back the tent up shape. at this point. We had a few different tents up. Um, not all of them had tent flies um, because of the <laughs> fact that we had and it's raining. Our gear. And it's definitely raining, raining, raining. So this took the better part of a day. Um, we were communicating. We take. Uh, we often will take dry erase markers <laughs> to create pictures. these these whiteboards. And so we're holding signs up to each other because it was quite hard to communicate all the way across the river. It was probably yeah. a total of 50 to 60 feet. All right. Just um, describe those, these whiteboards. It's not just dry erase markers, how we make them. <laughs> no, it's not. So this is, this is a great detail. It's a fun one. So one way to waterproof your gear when you're backpacking is to take a very hefty, often white in color, thick, plastic trash compactor bag. And so if you take that trash compactor bag and you slide it over an inflated sleeping pad, like a thermorest type, then all of a sudden, voila, mm -hmm. you have a backcountry whiteboard. So we're leaving messages for no each other way. and sending these signals back and forth. And eventually everyone calms down. We're back in order we have recognized that we do not have these two backpacks. We don't have a So they, they found one, but they couldn't get to it? They couldn't get to it. By the time they got back down, checking it out, it also went further down the river and they lost track of it. Uh, oh. Flash forward, that pack was eventually recovered by the same pilots who, who know the area and fly over the rivers, completely waterlogged several weeks later towards the end of the season. One oh, pack really? was recovered and one wasn't. Wow. Yeah. So crazy. you can imagine it was, it was quite a story. It was quite an afternoon. Um, we spent a lot of time processing with the students. We were able to eventually cross by walking further up towards what I had mentioned, the toe of the glacier. So instead of being one river channel, it was many, many, many small kind of braided, smaller channels. And so we recognized Hindsight is always perfect in 2020. That's what we should have done in the beginning um, is gone to find exactly that spot. We got ourselves all back together. Um, we debriefed, we documented everything. Um, the students really drew together. Interestingly, we had read a book. We had been reading aloud a book about the Ernest Shackleton expedition. <laughs> Okay, so this is an expedition way back in, I think, 1914. Um, it was an unsuccessful South Pole expedition. They then wanted to cross Antarctica, but got stuck in the ice. Yeah. However, the noteworthy thing about that expedition was that everybody lived. Right. And Ernest Shackleton, who was the designated leader, he, he essentially kept everyone's spirits up and they played games and they sang songs for over and a year, marched around together for over a year. Yeah. Now we weren't out there for over a year, but it does flash forward. And I know I'm going on a bit, but this is a no, good one. This is good. So uh, we then were in for some waiting around and some Shackleton like fun. So we finally got back underway. Mind you, we were down two, two packs. So that includes two sleeping bags that included one bag of food that included a stove and included a tent. So we rearranged ourselves. This is when you have to really appreciate your colleagues. And there were three of us sleeping in two sleeping bags, <laughs> trying to keep good wow. spirits, which we, which we did. And we kept moving. So the next day we actually, we had a hard walk up a, a little, a high pass called, we went up and over Patty's Peak. We took fun pictures at the top, spirits were back up. So the satellite phone is gone at this point. The satellite phone so is you, gone. You're not calling out saying, can you send us in some gear? 
Nope, we're not. Um, your, your next point of contact is your next re-ration? Is our next days? re-ration, which is two and a half days out All at right. about... And remember that we went about five and a half miles out of the way, so we're a bit behind. All right. We're a bit behind on our route for where we need to get. Um, so we get to, we get up and down and to kind of a flat open area that's near a lake. And lo and behold, at three in the morning, just a torrential downpour, the sky opens up and now the day prior, we'd been able to travel without rain gear for these two folks because it had stopped raining again. Um, but it became clear mm. that it was a, a full stop. We often use the word zero. That means we're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. So mm. it was time to hunker down. So we had to wait a couple days. We had to ration food. And the main thing was to, you know, to manage high emotions and we talk a lot at, at Knowles at that particular school. One of the leadership skills is tolerating adversity and uncertainty. And those students will certainly tell you that they got a good dose of that in that handful of days. Absolutely. So we haven't made it to our re-ration point. We're not allowed to call. <laughs> We're not allowed. We're not able to call. Do you have the ground air radio with you? But we've got the ground to air radio. With some fresh and batteries. So on with some fresh batteries. So on the morning of the re-ration, guess what? That, that famous Alaska fog has sucked us back in. So we have spread ourselves out. We've tried to make the tents look bright. If there were any, mm. you know, additional sleeping bags, we're trying to make ourselves visible. They knew where to come look for us. So it wasn't their first rodeo either. They also made a smart choice, which was instead of putting one plane in the air, they divided the weight of the food into two planes, took two pilots so they could take additional fuel oh. and spend a bit of time looking for us. But how did they know that they need to look for you? Because we, we hadn't called to confirm our re-ration, which was protocol. Uh, hey, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you at the X. Gotcha. And they didn't get that. So they went to where they, we should have been, didn't find us. And then they started to sort of backtrack, which okay. would have been a normal route. So it's foggy. We can't see planes, but we can hear planes. Uh, they do one pass over bzz, and don't find us. Oh, and you oh. can hear them. That's the worst. <laughs> when they, you're like, you're right here. Ah, we're here. And the students and we all are jumping and we're right here. And, uh, and I tried the ground to air radio yeah. and they didn't hear us. Nothing on the radio. Second pass by. I can't see them. We hear them again, but we hear their conversation. And so they're talking back and forth with each other. And I'm able to break in. Oh. So we're able to describe where we are. Lo and behold, we camped right next to a backcountry airstrip that we hadn't marked on our maps. There no was, way. You know, they did often you think, talk did you about, know it was there? Nope. They often talk about a small, you know, a small series or a long series of small errors. Right. Sure. Leading up to big incidents. So we yeah. also had a long chain of small good fortunes. Um, and this was certainly one of them. So they were able to land immediately. Even with they the traveled with a satellite phone. They called immediately to the branch. They got us more gear. And when they came back, you know what they also brought, which did worlds for our Shackleton crew spirits. They brought us some ice cream, Sean. No ice cream. So we are renewed. Oh, I thought we you were going to say some more leopard, leopard print uh, <laughs> clothing. <laughs> that would have done it. If only we'd had a, a wow. feather boa to complete the look. Oh, man. Um, Ice cream. So we're almost done with this story, but it's one of those, Sean, yeah. where it's not over till it's over. Right. Turn and back so playing we, ping pong. Till we're back playing ping pong. So, of course, <laughs> we said, hey, could we make this route any shorter? We're now number of maybe a couple days and certainly many miles behind and the answer is we're sorry but no it's no an way. a to b route we're headed towards a river where jet boats will will whisk uh, us out of the wilderness okay and doing that route up to the talking river remember that one in the southern yeah. talking the famous jet boat route um so i'll i'll skip ahead quite a bit but we did make it we made it out to our pickup spot but not after trying to cut more miles off where we tried to go down a steep mountain pass as the, the hikers and mountaineers will say that didn't go. Right. Essentially <laughs> oh, you get no. to a spot where you say, 
this is too precarious. We, you know, we didn't have mountaineering equipment. And so we had to turn around and walk back up. Ugh. And the student who had spent the most time in the water um, was one of the ones who had quite a time on that day. And we collectively did a quite nice thing to bring the spirits back up. And that was sing songs from the sound of music. So there we were, raindrops on roses. I can only and picture there you. we go, whiskers on kittens, right? So <laughs> they, Did they appreciate that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, good. And so we kept that up. We told stories. Um, this group was incredibly conscientious about taking care of each other. They were hard times, but we all really stuck together, pulled together. Let's just flash forward to the very end because we weren't done until we were done. So we were finally made it. We're sitting and waiting for the jet boat. We've congratulated ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. there are hugs, there's exhaustion. We can't believe it. And the boat shows up, but it's a small boat and it's not a big enough boat to put all of the members of the course on it. So guess what? Oh, no. Some of you are just going to have to wait a few more hours while the second boat comes along. There was some engine trouble and oh, okay. of course, <laughs> so some folks stay behind. And I actually ended up shipping out on, uh, on the first route and the singing and merrymaking continued. Um, I promise to not swear in your podcast and I won't, but I will say that that was the summer that we're on a boat. We're on a some kind of boat song got popular. So there were <laughs> resounding choruses of that. And I felt no need to censor any of the lyrics and, <laughs> and there was much joy in merrymaking. Wow. So as we're headed out down the river. So basically what a jet boat is, it doesn't have a propeller that goes down into the rocky water. Um, so you can go in very shallow waters. So these were shallow, fast moving waters. We're headed out on a boat, the boat that's headed in for the rest of the crew. We, we meet up with each other and, and the captains decide to have a quick conversation and exchange some information. And then as the boat takes off to go get the crew, I have a boat, I know a bit about engines, and I watched that engine not want to go into gear and simply stall out. I thought, okay, that's all right, engines stall all the time. So we're just getting set down a quite fast moving river, yeah. down river. We all yeah. knew about fast moving rivers. And he's unable to get the engine started. No. So here we are just getting set down the river, mm. down the river, down the river, and he was a, a good mariner, good sea person ship, as we say. So we did have a, a big, long line tied to the bow of the boat. So now we're getting back into populated territory. Folks are out salmon fishing, enjoying mm. the Alaska summer. And so there were people on shore, but we were far enough away that they couldn't do much, but sort of wave to us. Are you rowing we, or anything at this point? Are we what? Are you rowing? Do you have oh, oars? Oh, no, there was no, no, there were no oars aboard this boat. No, there was probably one paddle, but... It was fast moving current and, right. and we weren't going to really be able to do anything. Luckily, we were fairly quickly set against the shore. Of course, the first toss to someone on shore gets into someone's hands and the rope pulls out of their hands. So we bounce back out in the middle of the river. We finally make it. There's a toss to someone who's paying attention on shore. They grab the rope. They take a big wrap around the tree. Mm. And so the boat swings into shore guess what happens next, Sean? We watch the captain literally like a rocket shoot out of the back of the boat and cl like clamber, I don't know if that's a word, like a cartoon character up the shore. Because what has the boat done? It's hit a hornet's nest. <laughs> no way. <laughs> so this poor captain oh, is getting stung, man. stung, stung. And makes it to shore, gets rid of, I can't remember if they're actually bees or hornets, but um, no fun was had. He's able to get the engine started. We make it back to the, we make it back to, we call the, the where the Alaska program is headquartered, the Base. farm. It's an old dairy farm uh, in Palmer, Alaska. The students are recounting the experience of their life, the ups and downs. And something that felt very good to the instructor team was that after all of that, on a scale of one to 10, as we like to use in the backcountry wilderness medicine, they said that it was an eight out of 10 of the, of the best things, of the best experiences they'd ever had. No way. So we thought we were done. We're almost done. I'll almost let you wrap this up. Yeah. I know. But it's not over. <laughs> so we said goodbye to the students. 
Um, I've kept in touch with a good number of those students. Many of them have gone on to do wonderful things. Um, the one student who spent the most time in the water eventually returned to the school and has done a few different courses oh, wow. as, yeah, as uh, alumni courses. And oh, that's great. Yes. So it's, it's been a bit of a healing journey and, and some ups and downs to it, but it finally ended for our instructor team the next morning when we we're going to finish up and wash all the gear and have a, a decently long chat about all that had gone on out there. And we had a very kind program supervisor who's the one who sits down and does all the paperwork, which also had to be recreated as the written paperwork for the first part of the course had floated down the river. No, I didn't, so, I didn't ask So of course we, we rewrote all of that and, um, and we got a ride into town to a delicious breakfast place called Turkey Red. And as we're driving down the hill, the final approach to our breakfast, a lovely hot drink, some eggs, some, and the program supervisor says, ah, oh, I don't have the paperwork you know, is patting around on the seat and in the bag. And, and we make it to the restaurant and I volunteer. I say, you know, you all go in and go ahead and you know, order me a hot drink by all means. Today, it's going to be coffee with a little milk, no sugar. And I go back to the base to look for this paperwork. I say, I assume you left it, you know, on your desk or in one of the other common spaces where we had left. And I go and check the first common space, run into former hot drinks podcast star, Jim Chisholm, mm -hmm. and ask him, have you seen a pile of paperwork? And no, he hasn't. <laughs> and uh, we check again. And uh, so I go to the office of the program supervisor and there it is. But I go to pick it up and I notice that it's out of order and it's wet. <laughs> so the crowning glory, the feather in the cap, <laughs> cherry on the top of the story, was that the paperwork had been placed very safely and carefully on the top of the car. And so as we <laughs> pulled away from the farm to drive down to our final breakfast and hot drink, <laughs> uh, the paperwork, you know, kind of one piece at a time, flew no. off into the wind oh. and scattered across the farm. Uh, the person who saved the day actually was a student from from the sea lion nugget course story. <laughs> <laughs> he had fell in love with the whole experience of the wilderness and, and he came back and was working on the farm that year on oh. the grounds and facilities crew and happened to be on a driving tractor and happened to watch the car pull away. And so he conscientiously drove around and no reassembled way. every single piece of firework paperwork. That's and for I'll those folks who don't breath. know, yeah, for those folks who don't know, like <laughs> paperwork at Knowles is, is kind of a religion. It's like, it's amazing how well we treat our paperwork in the field. You know, it's amazing that we can go for 30 days backpacking, mountaineering, sea kayaking, and our paperwork comes back white and crisp, typically. <laughs> And, Definitely. you know, to lose one down the river that, you know, you didn't have a lot of control over that, but then like to have white crisp paperwork for, you know, I guess at this point, two weeks or so in the field and then come back and get it ruined when it's back at the branch, that would be a nightmare. I can't even, that has never happened that I've heard. <laughs> wow. We may have perhaps had an urge to add a little extra something into our hot drinks that morning, but we resisted. Yeah. We I'm finished sure that out. Was, uh, I'm we sure closed, that was a very uh, brief, uh, that was a very brief course log you wrote. <laughs> the, the brief course log and the brief debriefing. And as you've brief noticed, evaluations. The, <laughs> the brief evaluations and the brief retelling. Wow. Um, we actually had set ourselves up with one of the students, the director of risk management and a, an instructor who later had one of the students on a course to, to do a reflection of this incident. Hmm. Um, it has passed its statute of limitations, so we're, we're not in any kind of legal sure. binds about any decision making if anyone disagreed. Yeah. Um, but there was a ton of learning and it's all about really em embracing what we often talk about at the school and other places as a growth mindset. That's right. um, unfortunately, there was a, a family emergency that came up in that and that conference didn't end up happening. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then there was a quarantine and a pandemic. Wow. But <laughs> we're still learning from it today. And so there's no paperwork from that trip. So it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs>
what happened down at the river stays down right. at the river. Wow, um, that is a fascinating story. So that was a good long one. That'll probably yeah. be the, the one yeah. for the day. But yeah, thank you was... so much for the for the opportunity to retell it. And it was a big yeah. one, full of full of learning for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I only had one pack, one slip on a river once and uh you know, it didn't lead to a long story like that. It was, uh, I'll, I'll share it really quickly before we end up please here, do, but it was on the, on the Olympic coast uh, in Washington state. Uh, we do backpacking trip there with Knowles, about a 10 day trip on the coastline. Usually in the, well, it always happens in the fall and it's usually raining. It's basically, if it's not raining, it's a bonus. <laughs> and um, we were crossing <laughs> a river there um, and the river was kind of on a, we were walking the beach, the, we do a lot of beach walking there and a lot of boulder rock hopping and things like that. We got to play with the tides and we were walking on this beach. We had a river to cross on this beach and it was, it was a sandy river bottom because it was on a beach. And uh, one of our bigger students, and I think we, it was early on the course and we probably, you know, underestimated it. I don't even think we are doing a river crossing technique. Uh, the, usually the eddy method, as you described uh, yeah. so well. I think they were just kind of unbuckling and walking across and, and this guy slipped and we were like, Dro drop your pack, drop your pack. And he dropped his pack and it got swept into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the rest of us managed to get across fine. And we were just like, oh no. And we could see it like certain the waves and the surf oh. and the ocean, this backpack recirculating. <laughs> and concerned. a couple of the students wanted to run after and we we're like, no, 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 wait, no. like, no, like, don't, we don't need you out there in the surf recirculating. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we were just kind of scratching our heads and this big wave came up and dropped the backpack at our feet. <gasps> oh. <laughs> just dropped it at our feet. And then we like, <laughs> I think two people on each shoulder strap because now it's totally waterlogged dragged it up the beach a little higher up and um and we you know emptied it out dried it out as much as we could packed it back up and carried on and carried on as we will do <laughs> so, uh, that, that was a, that was a little shorter but yeah it was interesting seeing a backpack in the surf uh, on the ocean you don't kind of anticipate one of those uh, <laughs> no you certainly happening. don't and just that feeling of all all you know you try not to take much in a backpacking course yeah. but certainly the essentials and as you're watching all of your essentials you know <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. In any body of water, when you're supposed to be backpacking, unless maybe you're a pack rafter. <laughs> yeah. What you do, what you do take is important and what you do take is important and usually has two or three uses. So you, you kind of need it all. You kind of need it all. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, let, let's wrap it up with our okay. rapid fire questions. This has been great. It's been a real pleasure hearing all your very interesting and animated stories. I want to hear what's your favorite place, location to lead trips? Hmm. Oh, it's hard to pick just one. Yeah. Um, but I think that my my current home tells you really mm. where it is. And interestingly, my my partner now of many years is is a native of Baja, California, and <clears throat> has a family ranch project mm. that's actually land that's designated for conservation. Um, which is quite wonderful, that is just south of the town of Agua Verde. Oh, and nice. you're catching me. I, we, had, we had chatted a couple of weeks ago about getting together on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I'm just returning from a little respite from, from quarantine and certainly folks at Northern Latitudes from, from winter. Um, I just got to do a week-long sailing expedition mm -hmm. here on the Sea of Cortez, um, named originally... Uh, not for a Spanish conquistador, but uh, by local folks called the Mar Bermejo. And mm -hmm. that's Spanish for the Vermilion Sea. And often at sunrise and sunset, there's this extraordinary phenomenon that happens, which is that the water will reflect the same reds mm -hmm. of the sunrise or sunset. And so that's, yeah. that's where it got that name. And nice. so it's a very changeable sea. Sometimes it can be flat like a lake, um, sometimes it will get heavy winds and pick up four or five fixed six foot standing waves. We sailed in winds last week, um, of up to about 30 knots. Um, oh, wow. you can, <laughs> that was a lot of wind. Yeah, it was a much bigger a sailing boat than the ones that we right. sailed with on the expeditions or certainly than winds than you would ever think about kayaking mm -hmm. in. Um, right but yeah, this is quite a, quite a magical coastline where the desert meets the sea. Yeah. So this is right my, on. my uh -huh. preferred place to be out. Beauty spot. Right on. Okay. What's your favorite piece of gear? 
Oh, good one. A buff. I have yeah. a, yeah, I have a, it's a, I, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's made out of a light wool. Okay. Um, and so over the years, I found there's great synthetic gear out there. Um, but definitely people in cultures who have been living much more in contact with the elements than we do these days did a lot more um, with what they had, which are natural fibers. So I'm definitely a fan of wool. And the buff allows me to be a desert ninja down here in Baja, mm -hmm. California. It keeps me warm in Prince William Sound or places that I've also hiked like in India. And if you've got, I, I don't mean to make a jab, Sean, but if you've got a bad hair day in the back uh -huh. country, which my hair that's a bit longer than yours will sometimes, yes. you know, tend to experience, you can wrap it up onto your head and, and uh, nice. either cover a head with less hair or wield an, un, you know, tame an unwieldy mane right. um, of hair that, that <laughs> it also keeps your head warm. Exactly. And it also keeps <laughs> your head warm. Right on. Okay. Well, you may have shared this one already, but I'm going to ask it anyway and see if there's another answer. What is your best backcountry costume either that you've seen someone else or that you have used yourself? Oh, excellent. Um, actually, so in 2019, the last the last course that I worked uh, with Mills Alaska, they didn't operate last summer. And then I've been off doing doing other things for various reasons. But we had some spectacular costumes that were also accompanied by a small statue, perhaps, of the Knowles founder that perhaps made its way into the back country, but only perhaps this could be hearsay. Um, so the instructors who may or may not have taken this small statue along on a sea kayaking expedition. Also, there were two, two of us were women and one and one male instructor, but we all had prom dresses. No and way. prom dresses prom dress. are only ever made better if everyone also commits to wearing the bright red shade of lipstick that you would have to wear to a prom. Um, lipstick, that's a new one. Wow. <laughs> so lipstick, lipstick and prom dresses, um, wow. fully embraced by all members of the team. And then again, we may or may not have had a photo shoot with a small statue, statue on this particular Paul course Petzl. as well. I didn't know the statue existed of him. Wow. Uh, don't ask around. <laughs> All right. I, I guess I won't ask for any photos of that to post in the show notes. Um, well, if I uh, maybe if I if I contact the legal department, yeah. um, I could <laughs> see, see if we can get some special there, permission. There may or may not have been some special permission um, before the Knowles leadership uh, changed hands at, at the helm. There may or may not have been some participation in uh, the documenting of this small statue prank that either was or was not a prank. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, yeah, if you got pictures, we'd love to see them to see if this actually came through because we got vivid images on our mind right now of what palm dresses in the backcountry actually look like with bright red lipstick, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, maybe you just, uh, I don't know if this is the answer. Maybe you just gave this answer too. What is, when I, what image comes to mind when you hear the word adventure? Palm dresses mm. and red lipstick or something else? Uh, I would say it's it's the opposite. Okay. It's almost every student and student group that I have ever met started off looking quite like front country folks, we'll call them. So well-groomed, careful about the, the appearance of all of their clothes, whether or not they match, the colors went together, um, making smelling sure nice. that you're smelling nice, haven't spilled anything from lunch on them. And actually, uh, another instructor has a quote on the Knowles website that that's something to the effect of sort of the dirtier you get, the more real things become. Uh -huh. um, you nice. don't necessarily have to be dirty, especially if you are near bodies of water, but just leaving behind some of the conventions of what we feel we need to look like or how we need to present ourselves um, and having it be much more about who we are below the surface right. of our physical appearance. So, so this image of adventure is definitely a before and after picture. Um, people are also mm. in their physical body language, 
more shy, maybe, well, in this day and age, standing further apart from each other. And when they come back, you can see mm. the unity, you can see camaraderie nice, um, like in the physical language, in, in, in hair growth, and maybe some funny haircuts and styles that might have gone on while you're out there, mm -hmm. creative uses of clothing. Um, so that to me is, is adventure, folks who've gotten out of their yeah. comfort zone. And, uh, and start really off, have start something. off as a group of strangers and, and finish as a, as a family. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty beautiful. And yeah. I think that everyone who will come and talk with you has, has experienced that same kind of magic out there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last rapid fire question. If you had to go back to any one location, if you could go back to any one location and share a hot drink in the field, where would that location be? Oh, good one. Um, <laughs> I, I had a great, a great night of hot drinks with the only water available. Um, I know that you have spent some time in the course area where Knowles operates in India in the Himalaya. Mm -hmm. um, so a fun group of co-instructors, a basically a flash lightning storm brought us down from something we just walked up and we ended up seeking refuge in a shepherd's hut. No way. And so the only way that we were able to get water was either kind of digging muddy trenches or catching the runoff from this thick <laughs> thatched roof. And, uh, and so one of the students came up and approached that instructor group as we were preparing a dinner and a lovely hot drink and said, which water are we supposed to use? And one of the instructors who was uh, local, close, close to the area said, seepy water. And, and the student said, what kind of water? He said, seepy water. And the other instructor recognized that it was just a bit of the accent. He said, sheepy water. And, uh, and the person who said it first clarified seepy poopy water. And <laughs> as gross as that sounds, it was the water that we had. And, and I have been in many places where oh. you develop a, a massive and deep understanding for what it is to have fresh water but we're human beings and we're made of water and, and we need to drink the water we have. So you boil it up and you, and you deep, you know, you add tablet purification, if that's where you're at. Siphon um, it through a bandana. Siphon it through a bandana <laughs> and add Way your you coffee or your tea. We had mm -hmm. chai spice, nice. uh, some cardamom and anise seed and black pepper and black right. tea. So I would return shepherd's to the shepherd's hut wow. with my co-instructor and to have a hot drink of the CP. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's fantastic. Well, Liz, it's been a real treat. Thank you so much for coming on today. Before we, uh, before we wrap up, let's, uh, let's hear about what you have going on now. I know you have a lot of different projects and, and some different businesses going on. Just give us a brief summary of what you have going on and, and where people can find you if they want to get in touch. Sure, Sean. Thanks so much for asking. Mm -hmm. um, you can find me my full name. I'm on Facebook, Elizabeth Hammond. Um, a name I've adopted as the name of my sailing boat, Tranquila, Tranquila in English. So I'm Lizzie Tranquila on Instagram and Twitter. Nice. Um, and like many of us who spent a lot more time in the backcountry before the quarantine, I've been doing a lot of online teaching. And so I've, I've had to find the joy in that. I've got to connect with some fun students as well. And so I'm in the process of launching a website, which you'll eventually be able to find at elizabethchammond.com. And you'll be able to find a number of different kinds of online courses and offerings having to do with everything from leadership to Spanish and English language and cultural competence and a little bit of self-care and self-reflection while so many of us are, are still mm -hmm. stuck inside. Um, I had a wonderful teacher once who, who gave me some nice advice when I returned once from the mountains and was feeling a bit depressed being in the city and not having a connection with nature. And she reminded me that the mountain is inside of you. Mm -hmm. So nice. like that. my aim is to kind of help people connect with the natural places that, that are already inside of themselves if they're 
second, a situation of a bit of a, a nature deficit, like so yeah. many of us are these days. Awesome. When do you think that website will go live? Just so uh, folks six, can know. Or... Six weeks. So right. we're, we're holding at... you to it now. You've, you've announced in... it publicly. That's right. We're recording right after International Women's Day, which all I would right. like to send a shout out to mm -hmm. all my sisters and, and mamas and pias and everyone. Yeah. So look for me mid-May. All right. Awesome. That's the latest. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a real treat. And I think we could probably have you back for a second or third episode <laughs> with the stories <laughs> you have. Um, I know we didn't get them all today, but uh, I, I do want to get to them all. And so, uh, yeah, will you come back someday? I would love to, Sean. Uh, thank you for 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 going with my rather winding, long-winded yeah. style. Um, talking and storytelling is something I love to do. And I would I would be thrilled to join you again. Thank you so much for the invitation.